I think now is a good time to get started. So once again, good morning my, um, and good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Uh, this is our sixth webinar series uh, uh, of updates in COVID-19 clinical practice, um, hosted by the Consortium of USAID, EPIC, RISE, uh, and STAR UCSF. My name is Tyler Law, uh, and I am a member of the Center for Health Equity and Surgery and Anesthesia at UCSF and an anesthesiologist and critical care physician. I'll be moderating this event today, uh, and I'm very excited about the lineup we have. Today, our topic is the respiratory care of uh, patients with COVID-19 and all of the ways that that's changed. In the care of COVID-19 patients, it can feel like the landscape of evidence shifts constantly, and nowhere has that felt more true than uh, over the course of the pandemic than in the respiratory care of COVID patients. At times it has felt that every other week, new evidence has arrived that changes recommendation in terms of oxygenation, intubation, aerosolization. Um, well, now we're several years in, and in fact, a good amount of thought and evidence has been created on the respiratory care of COVID patients. And with that, I'll introduce our speakers um, where we'll be talking today over the updates, the WHO respiratory care guidelines, as well as uh, some of the lessons learned in those areas and the evidence um, where that has come from. So the, as I mentioned, the title will be Oxygen Therapies and Delivery Devices in COVID-19, Where Are We Now? I'll begin with reintroducing our uh, two speakers, Dr. Neil Adhikari, and uh, Dr. Uh, Rich Branson, or Rich Branson. Dr. Nero Adhikari is an intensivist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences and uh, works at the University of Toronto. He uh, co-leads the Toronto Addis Ababa Academic Coalition in Critical Care Medicine. He's part of the WHO Respiratory Expert Care Panel and co-chairs the WHO Guidelines Panel. Um, Rich Branson is the Editor-in-Chief of Respiratory Care, the official science journal of the AARC. Prior to becoming editor in 2018, he served as deputy editor for 10 years. So over 40 years as a respiratory therapist, uh, working in research education management at the University of Cincinnati, uh, and is currently professor emeritus at the Division of Trauma Care and member of the STAR UCSF Technical Advisory Group. He's over 300 publications and clinical interests in mechanical ventilation, critically ill patients, humidification, and disaster medicine. Um, Art will be joined later by uh, three other panelists as well, Dr. Sheila Maetra, Dr. Elizabeth Riviello, and Dr. Arthur Cruzera, who I will also introduce when we move to the moderated Q&A portion. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Dr. Adhikari. Great, uh, thanks very much, Tyler, for that introduction. Um, Let me just get my slides up. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to be talking to you as a co-chair along with uh, Srinivas Murthy from uh, uh, a pediatric intensivist in, in Vancouver in Canada. We, we co-chaired the recent WHO recommendations for non-invasive respiratory support for um, uh, patients with uh, COVID-19. And uh, this is the... Um, reference for the uh for the full for the full guideline um which is available um either from the who website um, um or uh in uh on a website called magic app which, which uh, has uh, some uh, data visualization features and the objectives of my talk are, are simply to review the recent who recommendations on non-invasive respiratory support for patients with severe or critical COVID-19. Uh, just to remind everyone uh, that, uh, that COVID-19 is still um, an active pandemic showing that uh, data from Johns Hopkins showing that uh, still lots of cases happening. And over the last 28 days, uh, still many cases throughout the world, um, uh, as you can see on the, in the map on the right. The, as you, as we talk about the WHO guidelines, um, just to um, refresh memories on the classification of the of disease severity um, 
which is a which is a classification that's now been around since the beginning of the COVID pandemic and developed by WHO. The focus here is on patients with severe or critical COVID-19. Um, so you can see severe patients are patients that are desaturated on room air that have respiratory distress or signs of pneumonia. Um, uh, critical patients re require uh, life-sustaining therapies or have a clinical diagnosis of acute respiratory distress syndrome or septic or septic shock. And in addition, the relevant population for, for this, these particular guideline recommendations include those severe and critical patients who also have a diagnosis of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, <clears throat> which is not further defined in the recommendations, but it's assumed that uh, clinicians have a common understanding of, of, of that entity. <clears throat> so I wanted to spend a, a few minutes delving into the guideline methods because I, I kind of think it's important to have some understanding of how these are developed to understand the outputs. Um, there were there were research questions which were organized into population intervention uh, uh, comparison and outcome. And these were uh, developed by the WHO with subst substantial input um, um, in, by the guideline uh, development group or the guideline panel. Um, after the PICO questions were finalized, the WHO commissioned systematic reviews of the evidence. And um, this systematic review considered evidence both from a direct population, which is uh, uh, patients with COVID-19, and but also uh, because of uh, limitations of data of, for patients with COVID-19 for some of the interventions, it also considered evidence from an indirect population of patients with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure without COVID-19. The the, the systematic review panel conducted a pairwise meta-analysis. This means that uh, the evidence that informed the recommendations were uh, direct comparisons uh, within each trial between intervention A versus intervention B, um, as opposed to um, more complicated kinds of uh, network meta-analysis that some of you might be familiar with. The, the clinical chairs uh, and the methods chair, who is Gordon Guyatt from McMaster University um, and the WHO team met with the systematic review team to um, uh, clarify the results, um, get some additional analyses and, uh, and uh, grade the level of evidence. And I'll get into what that means. And then the, uh, uh, the um, the, the methods chair and the clinical chairs uh, drafted some recommendations based on the, um, the, the summary of findings and presented these to the guideline panel, which then considered the recommendations and uh, uh, decided whether to uh, uh, modify them um, or approve them. And the guideline panel, in addition, had substantial input into the additional text that was provided with each of these recommendations. So the, the, a, a key point of the systematic review is not just to generate estimates of effect, but it's to generate, it's to consider what the certainty of evidence is in, the, is in, those, in those estimates. And generally speaking, randomized trials start out with a high confidence and certainty of, of uh, evidence of effects, but for various reasons, the confidence in those estimates effect of estimates of effect can be lowered. For example, if there's risk of bias in the, in the randomized trials, if there's inconsistency in the results, if the population is very indirect compared to the population of interest in the PICO, if the confidence intervals are wide, or if there's evidence of, of trials that might not be published. And so at the end of the day, you, you end up with a high level of confidence in estimates of effect, moderate, low, or very low. And you use that to generate recommendations. So you can either make a strong recommendation or a conditional recommendation. And a strong recommendation is one in which the benefits clearly outweigh any downsides. And a conditional recommendation is one where there's a closer balance between the benefits and the downsides. And whether or not to go with the recommendation really hinges on uh, patients' values and preferences on practical issues, uh, and these are often informed by, by lower certainty of evidence. 
So a strong recommendation in favor means that almost all patients would choose to have the intervention, but a conditional recommendation means that uh, uh, many patients would not choose to have the intervention, although, uh, although a majority of them would. So that brings us to the sources of evidence for these, for the, these non-invasive respiratory support um, uh, recommendations. There were three interventions considered, high flow nasal oxygen versus standard oxygen therapy, um, continuous positive airway pressure versus standard oxygen therapy, and non-invasive ventilation versus standard oxygen therapy, from which it, essentially most of the evidence came from face mask non-invasive ventilation. And you can see here that there's a variety, there's different amounts of evidence informing these, informing these clinical questions. For uh, high flow nasal oxygen, there were four trials of patients with COVID with a total of just over a thousand patients and uh, some more data from patients with non-COVID ARDS. Um, for CPAP versus standard oxygen therapy, only one trial in patients with COVID-19 with acute hypoxemic respiratory failure and uh, about the same number of patients in four other trials with non-COVID ARDS and in face mask NIV versus standard oxygen therapy, all of the data came from patients with, with non-COVID ARDS. All right, so here's the first recommendation. So uh, this pertains to patients in the hospital and you'll remember the population severe or critical COVID-19 plus acute hypoxemic respiratory failure who do not need emergent intubation, uh, the panel made a conditional recommendation for high flow nasal oxygen rather than standard oxygen therapy. And um, I apologize, I tried to get all of these summary findings tables on one slide. Um, so the way to look at this is that the first column is the outcome. And these were outcomes that were uh, decided in advance as to how important they are. And the critical outcomes for, for this recommendation are mortality, the, the need for invasive mechanical ventilation and hospital length of stay. And in a, another important outcome, but one that wasn't rated as critical was ICU length of stay. So if you just look at mortality here, you can see that the, the relative risk for, um, high for HFNO versus standard oxygen therapy was 0.87, with confidence interval of 0.66 to 1.13. And this came from three trials, a thousand participants. And if you look at the absolute effect estimates, you'll, what you'll see here is that um, uh, per thousand patients with, with this uh, uh, meeting, the inclusion, meeting this population criteria, 188 of them with standard oxygen therapy with, uh, in the trials died compared to 164 in, with, who were given um, uh, high flow nasal oxygen. And so the absolute effect here is 24 fewer deaths per thousand in the high flow nasal oxygen group, uh, but a confidence interval that crosses the null value. And uh, after considering this, the, the implication is that the certainty of evidence was rated as low and the plain language summary is that high, um, high flow nasal oxygen may decrease mortality. And similarly for invasive mechanical ventilation, HFNO may decrease uh, the need for invasive mechanical ventilation. There's a bit less uncertainty for hospital length of stay, so HFNO probably decreases hospital length of stay and probably has little or no difference on ICU length of stay. So because of the um, low certainty evidence for one, of the for one of the critical outcomes, the recommendation here ends up being conditional rather than strong. For CPAP, so the recommendation for CPAP um, in hospitalized patients with severe critical COVID-19 and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, not needing emergent intubation, same population. Again, the guideline panel made a conditional recommendation for CPAP over standard oxygen therapy. And the, the language when conditional recommendations are we suggest. Looking at the summary of findings tables here, um, you can see that there is low certainty evidence that um, CPAP reduces mortality in a hospital length of stay um, uh, with little or no, low certainty evidence that there's little or no difference on ICU length of stay. And again, uh, moderate certainty evidence that um, CPAP uh, reduces the need for invasive mechanical ventilation. And you may be wondering here, looking at invasive mechanical ventilation, why um, 
uh, it's only moderate certainty and with serious imprecision when the confidence interval for the estimate of effect excludes the null values. So you can see both sides of the confidence interval point to benefit. And this is one of these judgment calls in the application of the system of rating the certainty of evidence where um, uh, the, the panel felt that eight fewer uh, uh, patients progressing to invasive mechanical ventilation per, per thousand was very close to, to zero and therefore rated, rated that down as, as being an uncertain estimate of effect. Again, with mostly low certainty evidence informing this clinical question, uh, the, the, the recommendation in favor of CPAP is a conditional one. And finally, for non-invasive ventilation, and you can see here that they're you know, shown a picture here of helmets and, helmet and face mask interfaces. Again, the, the panel made a conditional recommendation in favor of non-invasive ventilation versus standard oxygen therapy. And you can see here that um, all of this is from an indirect population uh, of patients uh, with, with uh, hypoxemic respiratory failure who do not have COVID-19. And there's moderate certainty evidence suggesting reductions in mortality and invasive mechanical ventilation, and low certainty evidence suggesting reductions in hospital and IC length of stay. The, um, I think uh, Rich is gonna be talking about maybe some of these issues further, but the, the guideline development group um, may, uh, you know, cr created some practical information which is included in the notes to, to, this, um, uh, to this recommendation, to these series of recommendations around initial flow rates, uh, pressures, and, and how to titrate these therapies. Um, and, and there's certainly much more available, practical information available on, on how to use them than are contained in the guidelines. Um, some key points that emerged when considering this body of evidence were that um, at the time that this systematic review was conducted, which, which was several months, which was based on data um, up until the fall of 2021, um, all trials were conducted in high resource uh, care settings. And the panel recognized that um, implementation considerations included considerations around training of healthcare providers on oxygen consumption, on additional expertise and equipment requir required for monitoring patients on these treatments, um, on the needs um, and expertise required for maintenance of equipment, um, on how to organize the delivery of, of non-invasive respiratory support, and of course, on the cost, both uh, uh, device costs and personnel costs in terms of training and maintain maintenance of expertise. Th there were some questions that were considered, but for which no recommendations were made um, due to lack of certainty of evidence. And probably the most important one is the first. I mean, as a clinician, we one would like to see um, one would have liked to see the systematic review can uh, potentially rank these, these, these uh, non-invasive respiratory support options and come up with uh, recommendations about which one is best and potentially under which clinical circumstances. And there, within the randomized trial data, there, was, there, was, uh, there, there wasn't sufficient certainty of evidence to do that. Similarly, there was not, a, not enough data to, to make recommendations on different types of CPAP interfaces that one might consider or on non-invasive ventilation interfaces. Um, there are um, additional trials of respiratory support devices that are, that are um, either ongoing or about to start in resource-constrained settings, uh, which are led by co-panelists on, on this webinar. Um, so Arise Africa, led by Dr. Arthur Guzera, and the Breathe trial, trial led by Dr. Beth Riviello, uh, will, will both uh, be expected to add data to contribute to these recommendations in the future. And as trials, um, more trials become available, the network meta-analysis, which would allow for compare, indirect comparisons of, of, of treatments, for example, comparing high, high flow nasal oxygen to CPAP, as an example, that sort of analysis would be informed by network meta-analysis, which may be possible in the future. There's clearly a need for more research um, on comparisons between devices, on interface comparisons, 
Risks of aerosol generation, I'll just mention briefly that a separate WHO guideline does recommend that uh, each of these devices be treated as an aerosol generating procedure with, with, um, uh, with the appropriate uh, respirator masks in use. And the final research need is on the use of these devices in specific populations that generally haven't been included, including children and pregnant women. And I will stop there. Uh, apologies for apologize in advance for having to leave the discussion early for for another meeting. Thank you, Dr. Adhikari, for that uh, good overview of the evidence and understanding that it's not always clear uh, interpreting how the evidence goes. Um, thinking about other things that have shifted and have gone from unclarity to hopefully more clarity as the pandemic has moved on. Um, Professor Branson, would you like to share your slides and uh, tell us about some of the lessons learned? Sure, hang on a second. Okay, so I appreciate the, the opportunity and the invitation. Um, a lot of this work is based on um, a COVID guide that was just authored by a couple of colleagues of mine for the American Association for Respiratory Care, um, Dean Hess, Jay Lee, and Rich Calais. Um, so I will go through these individual parts and, and try to be more practical in my approach. So um, early on, we heard COVID. ARDS was different than other kinds of ARDS, and Gatinonia certainly provided some interesting evidence about early COVID and how ventilation perfusion matching was different. But over this period of time, um, it seems that the treatment of COVID-19 associated hypoxemic respiratory failure in patients with ARDS who are ventilated remain the same as previously. Tidal volumes of four to eight mLs per kilo, Try to keep the plateau pressure less than 30, the driving pressure less than 15. So again, the driving pressure being the difference between um, the airway pressure and end expiratory pressure. Um, the use of PEEP to reestablish functional residual capacity towards normal, generally 10 to 15 centimeters of water pressure, um, and also to reduce the effects of oxygen above 60%. Um, despite early reports that, that were very popular, especially in the U.S. on social media and in the lay press, um, the mortality for intubated patients is very similar in COVID-19 that it is to non-COVID ARDS, especially if you compare both groups with sepsis. Um, you know, the, kind of the famous story was the report in the New England Journal where it looked like the mortality rate if you were on a ventilator was 88% but 75% of the patients in that study were still in the hospital at the time of the report. So readjustment still gives you a mortality rate in the 30 to 40% range. Um, after mechanical ventilation, there seems to be a signal that there's a risk for post-extubation strider in patients with COVID-19. Um, some people have tried to suggest this is because of the viral load present um, in the trachea. Uh, there, it, there's a link there The patients who have higher viral loads seem to have more problems with esophageal or such <laughs> with um, post extubation strider, but it's probably the fact that the patients are on the ventilator for quite a long period of time and they're more often used prolong, um, prone positioning. And if you have never done it, when you prone a patient, if you measure the cuff pressure, the change in the way the endotracheal tube is in the trachea and the torque on it. Um, can result in significantly increases in airway pressure or cuff pressure. And you think, well, how can the cuff pressure change um, without changing the amount of air in it? And the answer is quite simply because the cuff changes inside the tube, which is the trachea, which of course um, changes how that cuff pressure is accomplished. So um, those are a couple of things about COVID ARDS that seem to have a signal um, and suggest that um, we can be pretty confident about. Um, Neil just talked about this issue of um, aerosol generating procedures. Um, there have been some clarification about definitions, like a bioaerosol is generated from the patient, like during coughing, 
inducing a sputum, bronchoscopy in a non-intubated patient, and can be potentially infectious. <clears throat> there are medical bio bio aerosols that are generated during treatment, so aerosol therapy with an updraft nebulizer. And then the source of um, a considerable amount of study has been fugitive aerosols, those that escape the environment during treatment with medical devices. So if, if I can kind of share this. So this is uh, from a paper by Jay Lee, who's a respiratory therapist, um, PhD at Rush in Chicago. And on the left, she's demonstrating um, the, different, the, the different uses of mitigation as well as the kind of bioaerosols. So on the top left, you have a patient on a, a regular cannula, a high flow nasal cannula, a face mask, and then a nebulizer. Um, and if you look to the right, most of those procedures are considered aerosol, are not considered aerosol generating procedures at this point in time, but have been referred to as dispersive therapy. So, and I'll show you a, a photo here in a second, but when you're on high flow nasal cannula, those patients are no more likely to infect the caregivers um, because of high flow nasal cannula. They're, where they become a problem is when they cough or sneeze um, during, during their therapy. And then the high flow from either the cannula or the face mask or anything else can disperse the particles further into the room. But you know, as, for most issues like source control, um, you put the face mask on the care on the patient if they can tolerate it when you're in the room, as well as wear your own personal protective equipment. Um, second down there on the left in the middle is the use of a filter on a nebulizer to reduce the patient's exhaled gas into the room. Um, the other one is for pulmonary function testing, again, demonstrating the use of a filter to reduce those problems. On the right, you have the helmet, um, shows um, the addition of filters to the inspired and expired portions. Um, here in the US, we really don't have access to the helmet, um, except for in a couple of, of small cases. So I don't have a lot of, of experience with that. I've worn it when I was in Europe. Um, the use of uh, non-invasive ventilation, the second panel on the right in the middle, demonstrates again that the addition of filters can help reduce these problems of um, aerosols in the room. Um, the bigger the bigger aerosol generating procedures actually tend to fall into intubation and bronchoscopy and opening suction open suctioning. So um, again, in, in any case, there doesn't seem to be a big change associated with the therapies that we were worried about early on. So and this is a paper by Reinout Berm from Switzerland, and he's looking at particles um, in the room with these different. Um, subjects. And here you have um, high flow nasal cannula. You can see there's virtually nothing, <laughs> no particles in the room. S same patient with a cough and then high flow nasal cannula and aerosol delivery through the high flow nasal cannula. So there are some differences that occur, but cough by the patient is by far the most concerning um, aerosolized generating procedure. And Again, if the patient can tolerate it with when they're on high flow nasal cannula, you can add a face mask um, to them. And of course, the caregivers need to wear protection. So at, at this point, our, our approach has been that high flow nasal cannula is not an aerosol generating procedure. Non-invasive ventilation is not an aerosolized uh, aerosol generating procedure. Um, nebulizers in particular should be avoided um, unless it's absolutely necessary and you should use a filter. Um, here in the U.S., a lot of patients get albuterol. Virtually every ventilated patient seems to be getting albuterol. And the general consensus is that it doesn't hurt. Um, this increased risk suggests um, that's probably a, not a good practice. And if you look back at it, the only study of albuterol in ARDS was one of the ARDSnet studies that proved patients who got albuterol did worse. Um, so we should probably avoid that in, altogether. In intubation boxes, which were very popular at first, to try and protect caregivers who are doing the intubating um, have appeared to increase intubation failure because people think there's, and also lapses of the use of personal protective equipment because people think the box is protecting them. They st still wear their masks. Non-invasive respiratory support Neil talked about, which for me means treatment with CPAP, um, which is not a ventilation technique. It's an oxygenation support, nasal can high flow nasal cannula. Um, 
is a vent is not a ventilation technique. Um, but non-invasive ventilation should for sure not be withheld from patients who have a um, known positive impact, so COPD, um, because you're worried about aerosolization. Again, the use of filters can help mitigate that problem. Um, I will tell you that when you do um, use a filter, it can impact the triggering of certain ventilators, so you have to be careful. Um, CPAP was used far more often based you know, looking at the literature in the UK and Europe than it was in the US, but has always been an effective treatment of hypoxemia. High flow nasal cannula, as Neil showed, is certainly beneficial in severe hypoxemia. In less severe hypoxemia, the addition of high flow nasal cannula probably wastes oxygen um, and you should use standard oxygen therapy. And there are a couple of, of measurements, the ROCS index for high flow nasal cannula and the HACOR index for predicting success with NIV or CPAP. So the ROCS index, you use SpO2, FiO2, and respiratory rate. And here is the um, it, it, but a paper from Roca that looks at um, what the ROCS score is at two, six, and 12 hours, and kind of gives you an idea of whether to consider intubating the patient, evaluate the patient in another 30 minutes, or continue monitoring. And that, with, in the interest of time, I'll just show you this and let you know that there at least is some evidence that um, we can use this to just to make sure we don't leave patients on high flow nasal cannula too long who need to be intubated. I think intubation is still empiric. Um, early intubation in patients with low levels of oxygen requirements certainly isn't recommended. Um, in select patients with COVID-19, if you delay intubation for too long, um, you can use the addition of non-invasive therapies, but Again, my experience, even before there was anything that we called COVID-19, is that non-invasive ventilation, BiPAP face mask, with patients with a PF ratio less than 150 is uniformly um, unsuccessful, um, usually you know, 60, 70 percent failure rates. Um, and NIV failure and hypoxemic respiratory failure occurs pretty easily or pretty quickly. You don't have to wait a day or two days. Um, generally, if you can't return oxygen saturation to normal, you can't get the respiratory rate to fall, and the patient improve in their comfort in two hours, they probably need to be intubated. Um, prone positioning, uh, I, I think, was for sure underutilized before we had COVID-19, um, in part because it's difficult. Um, a lot of people don't want to do it unless they have this special bed, but it can be, and I don't want to say it can be easily done, it can be done with a dedicated team to make sure that it happens by turning patients using bed sheets. Um, there is some evidence this, that suggests that non-intubated patients, so-called awake prone, um, can reduce the need for intubation, and most retrospective studies point to that effect. Um, but typically, it's the combination of awake prone positioning combined with either high flow nasal cannula or NIV. Um, a recent prospective trial um, out of Vanderbilt suggests that there are greater complications with awake prone positioning that haven't been um, seen with retrospective reviews. And it needs to be done as much as the patient tolerates. If it's not at least 12 hours a day, it probably isn't gonna be helpful. We saw a lot of oxygen shortages and I'm sure that in other parts of the world, it was um, more common than it was here in the US, even though places in New York, California, Louisiana had either complete exhaustion of their supplies or near complete, where they had to resort to backup supplies. Um, strategies for reducing oxygen uses are important. Um, how your um, hospital is piped has a particular issue here in COVID-19 and surge capacity ICU. The floor that you normally care for the mothers after they've delivered their babies um, doesn't have the same size oxygen piping that um, systems do in your ICU. So if you try to create that into your new ICU um, floor bed um, space, you'll find out that you can't run three or four high flow nasal cannulas from that oxygen system. And um, it causes the alarms in the wall to go off because it's drawing too much flow. And then I'll show you some pictures of how when you're using a liquid oxygen, how that can actually create an issue for delivery um, I think I've only seen it happen a couple of times. And believe it or not, high flow nasal cannula and non-invasive with a leak at the higher FR2s are the largest consumers of oxygen. 
and uh, in the interest of time when when the pipes come into your hospital they come in from the outside of the liquid system they go up or they go sideways which makes them either what laterals or risers and where the zone valves are and where the outlets are is where there are restrictions and can reduce the flow to your devices and cause alarms um, i'm sure you guys are going to have access to these slides after this but this is just kind of an idea of your typical oxygen therapy devices and how much oxygen they use and what you can get from the fio2 um, the expected fio2 and if you look again uh, most people can't seem to fathom that mechanical ventilators use less oxygen than high flow nasal cannula but they do and anytime you have non-invasive ventilation in the presence of a large leak you can really burn through your oxygen so on the top are our four pictures across the period of the COVID-19 epidemic at the Cleveland Clinic. And on the left, you can see not much had happened in April of 2020. So the icing on the coils that turn the liquid into gas isn't too bad. They got really busy in September, um, then it moved over to January. And the thing that can happen is this bottom picture is the ice can actually freeze the regulator that controls the flow going to your hospital. And if it does that, then it, you'll lose oxygen flow to your hospital completely. So on the right, this is a picture Asha Devereaux from San Diego provided for me. They put up standard sprinkler systems with warm water around their um, oxygen, oxygen delivery system to, wa to wash the ice off the coils. Um, humidification has been interesting during High, during COVID-19, early on, everybody seemed to think there was not really a secretion problem. Um, here's a patient on the right. I hope you can kind of see, you know, this is the HME here in green. And then there's a little bunch of secretions in red down at the bottom and the suction catheter. But the other issue is when you're using HMEs, you have to account for dead space. And this is a picture from a paper in chest by Francois Lelouch looking at with heated humidification, the dead space, the part the equipment dead space that the patient rebreezes in red but with an hme it includes the the catheter mount as you see on the patient on the left as well as the hme itself and and most of us or some of us remember when hmes were introduced and the average tidal volume in the icu was 800 to a thousand milliliters so having a 60 or a thousand or a hundred milliliter hme was not a problem in today's tidal volumes of 300 and 400 this can really result in co2 um, rebreathing and accumulation. I'm trying to keep on time here. I think I have about three and a half minutes. Um, shared ventilation, so more than one patient on a single ventilator. Um, certainly, if you're going to do this, two is the maximum. Um, I, I've been telling people before COVID-19, there were five papers about um, shared ventilation in the literature, and two of them were papers that my colleagues and I co-authored um, trying to get the people who wrote the papers about it not to do it, that it wasn't, they hadn't accounted for all the problems. And um, I, th I think there's been some really elegant literature written about this whole issue from an ethical standpoint. And one of the comparisons is, is it better to have a lifeboat, a ventilator um, with the recommended number of passengers, or do you overload the lifeboat and risk losing everybody? Um, so there's a, a point at which you have to assume that um, one patient's going to die without mechanical ventilation and that having two on the same ventilator isn't going to increase the mortality for both. And I'll just show you, this is from Jeremy Beatler, who I think has the longest um, reported shared ventilation cases. He, had, he did three pairs of patients um, in New York right before he thought he was going to have to do this on a routine basis. And I know this is a little hard to see, but um, as you go through it, um, you're looking at the different patients for their different variables, pH, pCO2, PF ratio, minute volume, tidal volume, um, tidal volume and based on predicted body weight and peak pressure. The first two, they used an anesthesia ventilator and had all kinds of problems with humidity in the system, which was another lesson learned in COVID-19. Um, and I, I'll admit that before COVID-19, I had often written in disaster medicine texts that we could use anesthesia ventilators in the ICU and it would be a great way of doing this and it turned out to be far more difficult than any of us really believed but suffice it to say these patients were on for 48 hours they all got transitioned back to single ventilators and Dr. Beatler would tell you that the uh, 
amount of additional monitoring that it requires to do this um, makes it not worthwhile because because it requires more intensive care for just those few patients. Um, and you'd be better off trying to use other mechanisms like non-invasive ventilation for invasive ventilator um, or CPAP um, or high flow nasal cannula. Um, my one comment about the, I, I, I think a great heartwarming story of the COVID-19 epidemic is a lot of people with engineering talent and their own treasure went out to make do-it-yourself ventilators. Um, again, very noble, but it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. And um, I think Mike Lipnick was the first person who told me <laughs> um, we should have a mantra that if the next time we have a co uh, epidemic that needs mechanical ventilation, one of the mantras should be don't make a ventilator for the first time. And none of those in my experience have been helpful. Um, the idea of using recirculating devices to save oxygen so the patients, you know, like an anesthesia system, exhale through a CO2 absorber, um, oxygen conserving devices, these things have all been tested. Um, picture of the Buzignac CPAP device on the bottom right. Um, but with recirculating, you change one precious resource, oxygen, for another resource, CO2 absorbent, which isn't as um, available as some people might think. Okay. Um, thank you. I think I tried to stay on time. So um, I'll turn it back over to Tyler. Thanks, Professor Branson. Um, so for now, I will very briefly introduce our other uh, panelists. We also are joined by Dr. Sheila Maitra. Uh, Dr. Maitra is a professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine working at the uh, Tata Memorial Hospital in Mumbai, India. She's the president-elect uh, of the Indian Critical Care Society of Medicine and the chair of the Intensive and Critical Care Society Medicine Committee of the World Federations of Societies of Anesthesiologists and a member of our STAR UCSF Technical Advisory Group. We're also joined by Dr. Elizabeth Riviello, who is, uh, has research focused on ARDS, sepsis, and low-income countries. She has a particular interest in examining how context impacts critical care epidemiology, interventions, and outcomes, and is leading a randomized controlled trial of high flow versus standard flow in sub-Saharan uh, sub Africa, and is also a member of our STAR UCSF technical advisory group. We also have Dr. Arthur Quisera, who's an associate professor of anesthesia and intensive care at Macquarie University College of Health Sciences and a staff intensivist at the Malago National Referral at Hospital Intensive Care Unit in Kampala, Uganda, and a member of the STAR UCSF Technical Advisory Group, the WHO uh, Respiratory Ex Expert Panel, and the COVID-19 Interim Guidance Panel. Um, so with that, we're going to start our moderated Q&A, and I encourage um, everyone to please put any questions you have into the Q&A, uh, use the Q&A function of the chat at the bottom. I can see there's already one Q&A, which we'll get to in a second, um, after we uh, initially start with uh, our first question. And my first question I'm going to direct to uh, Dr. Quisera, if that's all right. Um, Dr. Quisera, uh, the guidelines suggest that in critical or severe patients not needing intubation, that's those with a respiratory rate of 30 or an SpO2 of less than 90, to go to high flow or CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. Can you comment on whether this recommendation applies to patients who present with these findings at triage before standard oxygen therapy has been applied? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, Tyler. Thank you for that question. Thank you for having me. And um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Well, um, <clears throat> that 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 question has to be interpreted with a bit of context. Um, this particular recommendation refers to patients who have um, um, who are already on stand, standard oxygen, uh, who are, actually have acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So they should have been, or they should be on some form of standard oxygen. Uh, in my practice, I. For me, the way I would see this recommendation, it's really not about where you are, but what level of uh, respiratory support you're going to get. There's, in practice, uh, especially in low-income countries where we have limited oxygen resources, um, it would be very impractical to start patients on high-flow CPAP um, directly. 
would definitely have to give them a trial um, of, of standard oxygen. Uh, you, you'll also know, um, having been uh, to parts of Africa, that we, we don't have standardized emergency departments, triage rooms, and so on. So your typical um, resuscitation area for a patient respiratory failure may be anywhere, typically will be on the ward. And so um, that's where you'd have uh, the resources for oxygen therapy. And <clears throat> the, in the patient who has these parameters, the recommendation focused on patients with severe COVID and acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. So they would already be on some form of uh, sun and oxygen. Um, and, and so for me, um, I would put, I would let this patient go be on standard oxygen of up to maybe 10 liters per minute before I apply these recommendations. And that is also subject to <laughs> my, the resources that I have um, available to me. I hope, I hope that answers the question. Sorry. Thanks, Dr. Quizera. Um, I, I see there's a few qu qu questions in the Q&A and um, I think we'll go to those uh, first now, actually. Um, the first question, I think uh, perhaps Dr. Uh, Professor Branson can uh, answer this. Um, if closed suction is not possible, is there any way to avoid losing PEEP and aerosol generation? If you don't have a closed su circuit suction catheter, there are adapters, kind of like the bronchoscopy adapters that can go on the end of the endotracheal tube and have like a cross slate shaped slit in them and as you pass through there it helps to maintain it but in the absence of that there's really no if you're going to take the patient off the ventilator and slide the catheter down there's no way to provide peep and there's also um, no way if the patient coughs to prevent the aerosol from being um, coughed into the room i don't know if anybody else has a different opinion Right. I'd just like to add, uh, absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, I'd just like to say that what's most important is your concern about aerosol generation is to, essentially for the healthcare worker and the people around. So you can minimize the stuff, the people, uh, and of course, protect the healthcare workers. So if that's, that's done adequately, I mean, uh, even if there is uh, some aerosol generation, it should uh, take care of the uh, problem and minimize the time for suctioning, of course. And uh, I don't think you can avoid, uh, you know, de-recruiting or loss of PEEP in this if you're going to disconnect and not use a closed suction. So that, of course, is the downside of doing open suctioning. And it's difficult, of course, because these patients need suctioning as a critical component of their therapy. Um, so it's a, an ongoing balance of uh, maintaining that peak, but also making sure that the, the circuit remains patent and the airways remain patent um, as well. Um, I'll uh, just highlight that this is an important question that uh, Professor Brinson already answered. Uh, how long do you give standard oxygen therapy before reassessing um, for possible high flow or uh, non-invasive ventilation. And his suggestion was two hours. Um, and I think the key is uh, frequent reassessment. Uh, is the more critical the patient, the more frequent the reassessment, um, if the panel would agree with that as well. Yeah, yeah I, I again, I, I should, probably should have just waited, but I saw it pop up and I thought, well, I'll just, it says answer the question now. Um, I, I think, at two hours, it, things have either gotten better or you need to do something new. Now, in 15 minutes, it may become evident to you, you also need to do something new. Um, so the patients need to be observed and if possible, monitored. Um, but a, a, again, even before COVID-19, our experience was patients who went on an NIV for COPD, for acute exacerbation of COPD. Um, if they didn't get their SpO2 up, if their worker breathing didn't fall, then lose their, still have accessory muscle use, those patients are gonna end up being intubated and delaying it is a waste of time. I'd just like to add that two hours doesn't mean that you have to wait until two hours because some of these patients could acutely deteriorate. So I think the key, like uh, Rich said, is to monitor them very closely when they're on any non-invasive respiratory support and look for clinical signs of deterioration and that should be your cue to uh, you know, consider intubation, whether it's 10 minutes or an hour and a half, I think uh, close monitoring is the key. Thank you. Um, one question that we have uh, and that I've had um, discussed before is that the recommendations 
uh, lack evidence, they said, to make the determination between uh, non-invasive ventilation and CPAP and high flow nasal cannula. And in some situations, um, more than one of those may exist. Uh, how does the panel go about thinking about how to make the determination of which sort of advanced therapy, uh, knowing that you know, the guideline panel specifically tried not to make a recommendation, but you know, as clinicians, we're often forced to make some sort of determination. Uh, so how do you think through the selection of those therapies? Doctors, yeah. I would say um, in a high income country setting, what we're really doing is looking at each individual patient. And so for instance, CPAP, it can be very effective at um, reversing hypoxemia, but it can also be very uncomfortable. Or if a patient has poor mental status, it can be unsafe due to aspiration risks. Um, but in a resource variable setting, you actually have to take more into account. Of course, you take into account what you have between the, the various devices but also, um, and CPAP, in fact, regardless of the patient status does, I think, require more monitoring on a closer basis, and you may not have the staff to do that, but CPAP can provide um, better reversal of hypoxemia with less oxygen than high flow, depending on the patient. So you're, if your oxygen resources are a bigger deal than your staffing resources, then you might choose high flow. I would say in reality, most resource variable settings don't have all those options just sitting around and they're picking and choosing between them. Um, but if you were, it's, it's a matter of choosing really carefully where are your resource limitations greater and also what does the patient look like in that case. Dr. Maitre, do you have any comments on? Yeah. Um, so again, I agree with Beth. It depends upon not only the resource availability, but also your comfort levels with using the uh, equipment and the devices. But having said that, um, unfortunately, with COVID, there, we don't have very robust, you know, randomized controlled trials where we can say, yes, this therapy, one is over better than the other. But if you look at the non-COVID data, if you look at, say, for example, data from the lung safe study and uh, other studies, and you look at uh, patients clearly where the P2F ratio is less than 150, uh, NIV has actually been uh, worse and resulted in higher mortality. Uh, you also see that hyphronasal oxygen is better tolerated by the patient. So my, and, and when you put a patient on NIV, you see these uh, COVID patients typically have um, very compliant lungs and you see the high tidal volume and we're worried about the PCLE. So my personal preference would be uh, to use um, hyphronasal oxygen for these patients if they tolerate it. Sometimes a trial, a switch to non-invasive ventilation before an attempt at intubation um, but by and large, when there, I, I would avoid giving uh, non-invasive, and my preference would be more to give uh, high nasal oxygen, though there's no uh, very robust data to support this uh, approach. Thank you. Yes, uh, of course, it'll come down to a lot to institutional familiarity, it sounds like, and uh, the resources available, which are, are going to be different in every place. Um, uh, one question from the Q&A is uh, on the question of proning, which is a, um, a, quite the, a difficult task a lot of the times in the best of times, but particularly for morbidly obese patients, uh, what are some suggestions to make it easier for them to maintain a prone position for at least 12 hours a day? Uh, again. There are some groups that are very positive about wake awake prone positioning. Um, there are other groups that have, you know, found that the patients don't tolerate it for very long, that they're so sick when they come in anyway, if you want to try to get them in the prone position, you still have to turn them. It's not like they can do it themselves. Um, I, I think it's positioning with pillows, you know, try to keep the pressure points moving left to right. Um, but some people just, quite frankly, are not going to tolerate it. I don't know if anybody has a secret. I don't have any secrets. <laughs> I agree. I just want to make one comment about awake proning. We, we did a lot of awake proning during COVID, and now the evidence is more in favor of this, even for uh, non-intubated patients. But uh, I think the monitoring becomes even more important when your patient is in prone position. Because uh, a lot of times uh, when this patient is prone, you miss monitoring some, you know, you miss some subtle signs. And uh, I often worry when I used to prone these patients about delaying intubation. And uh, I think they need to be more closely monitored uh, when you do uh, proning in these patients. Uh, 
Yeah, I think, yeah, I agree. What with the with regards to monitoring, one of the tricks we employed um was for their work page was to get um to improve patient compliance, was to uh teach them the value, uh, especially when proning improved uh, the oxygen saturation. You'd ask the patients, you'd show them the patient monitor when they were proning and when they were not, and they would see the differences. So somehow they picked it up and tended to be more uh, compliant. They, they tried to also participate in their own care. Uh, not always successfully, but it was something that we, that helped us, especially where you had one ward that had 30 patients uh, and, you, and you had only one nurse. And so that was, <laughs> that we found that helpful. I, I think regardless of your, the resources you have, of course, resources are always Im important. The physician in charge with any non-invasive therapy, whether it's high flow, standard oxygen therapy, NIV, CPAP by face mask, or with and without awake proning is, you have to make an a priori decision of when you are going to say, this therapy is no longer working. And again, in a very high resource setting in an intensive care unit, um, I've seen times where patients are failing non-invasive ventilation and you know, it's busy in the ICU and you say, well, let's, you know, after rounds, let's check before we go to lunch. And then something else happens and you say, well, let's check after lunch. And, and you push these patients um, beyond where they ought to be pushed. And that's where you start to see this excess mortality associated with some non-invasive therapies as well as awake prone positioning. So I think the key is to draw a line in the sand and say, if this patient doesn't achieve these goals by 10 o'clock this morning, we're going to go from standard to high flow, from high flow to CPAP, from CPAP to, to intubation. Uh, if I may just add a uh, point, I agree completely. And I, uh, you know, what we were seeing in the beginning, we were intubating patients very early because we were just looking at the blood gases and we were seeing these very low PO2s. And then we, over time, we realized that these patients, uh, unlike with non-COVID ARDS, when they have worsening of gas exchange, they also have deterioration. They have deterioration in respiratory mechanics. But we were not seeing that in COVID patients, and they were tolerating it better. So our threshold to intubate also uh, started to go higher. Nevertheless, uh, the more Monitoring really is the key because even if you're not intubating them with that low PO2s, you know, uh, monitoring for clinical signs of deterioration is very important. And then what started to happen was very delayed intubations. You have somebody who's absolutely gasping and then getting intubated. And then they say, oh, you know, intubating was them was increasing the mortality. So I completely agree with uh, Rich that you have to have your endpoints that this is my cue to intubate this patient. And uh, rather than look at ABGs, X rays, and blood gas. We started going purely clinically with the patient. We started looking for clinical signs of respiratory distress, looking at the respiratory, looking at the saturation, looking at the comfort of the patient, looking at use of accessory muscles. And this was our cue to intubate the patient, uh, you know, or, to, or escalate to the next uh, level uh, rather than just looking at uh, blood gas. It was a combination of all these things. But we started going more clinically. And if we felt that even if the saturation was maintained, but the patient was tachypnic and uh, you know have using accessory muscles, we would intubate this patient. So I think it's very important, like Rich said, to have uh, you know clear cut goal that this is what I want to achieve, and if I don't achieve this, I'm going to intubate the patient, rather than wait for a time when the patient completely decompensates, and then probably it's too late and you won't get benefits of uh, invasive mechanical ventilation in these patients. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree with all that. Just to say, um, agree with all of that. I just, in in terms of uh, shared experience, which I'm sure many people on the call have had, COVID really did stretch us a bit. For the same, we were early intubating because we didn't want to put either patients or providers at risk, and then discovered people, in fact, were not deteriorating super quickly. They could hang out on high flow for a long time and do okay. And I think it's made it more difficult to make those judgments. So when someone is tachypnic and work of breathing is high, then absolutely they need, you know, when that starts, they need to be intubated. But I think what's been hard in COVID, which I really hadn't experienced, at least in large volumes before, was these patients who are extremely hypoxemic, but their mechanics are pretty good and they don't look bad. And then you have to figure out what to do with them. And I'll say, at least at our center, we don't have a good answer. When people look good, they're maintaining oxygenation on these non-invasive methods. Um, people have different practices. And I've just, I say that for the group, just in terms of people's experience, I suspect many people on this call have had that experience. And I will say making those decisions is not easy and people do different things. Right, okay. I just like to add a point. We used to have these patients uh, who were not 
who didn't need intubation, patients like you're saying, who, who didn't require an intubation, were uh, you know, static on say non-invasive ventilation, but they weren't getting better either. They weren't getting off NIV. And in these kinds of situations, it's very important to look for other causes of deterioration. You know, sometimes it may be a pulmonary embolism, it may be something else that you're missing. So they would say, you know, people would call and say, oh, this patient's on NIV for like uh, 10 days and he's not worsening that I need to intubate him and he's not getting better either. So these are just, uh, you know, some practical things that we learn as we manage these patients. I, I, I'd be interested to see, think what, hear what Mike says. One of the things that's been interesting to me with COVID-19 has been, um, you know, I'm, I'm the one with the grayest hair on the, on the screen. I mean, I can remember when we, we started using PEEP or CPAP whenever anybody needed more than 60% oxygen because that was toxic and we didn't want to expose the patients to 60% oxygen. And, you know, again, you may be surprised early on, we would increase the PEEP until the cardiac output fell by more than 20%. And that was the best PEEP, you know, and then we, we just did it by shunt fraction, all this other stuff. But it, it seems to me with high flow nasal cannula, nobody seems to be concerned at all of giving 80 or 90% oxygen at 60 liters a minute for days on end. And there doesn't seem to be any, any negative effect. I know Mike's our resident expert on oxygen. Do you have any thoughts about oxygen toxicity in that group or Tyler, you're with the same people? Yeah, Rich, I think it's a great point. Um, you know, it is uh, certainly an issue. Cumulative pulmonary oxygen dose and uh, toxicity is real. Um, why we're not able to tease that out, why we're not seeing that, um, uh, is it something that may come with with future data? I, I think it is right to think about it always. Um, if not for for oxygen toxicity reasons, and certainly for oxygen conservation reasons, um, which which may be um, may have been a bigger issue uh, in terms of overall outcomes, but. It's certainly a real phenomena, um, and I don't think anybody knows why we're not seeing the data yet, um, but something to keep an eye on. Uh, if I may just add a point here, I agree with Mike, we don't have data, but one of the things I was observing was we start with say 100, of course you can't give 100%, it's about 97% FiO2, but uh, subsequently people weren't coming down on the FiO2. So you have to titrate it to your saturation, your uh, target saturation uh, until we had an oxygen crisis and we started you know, getting conscious of how much oxygen we were using. People weren't really doing this. So they would start at, and you know, just keep the patient on high FiO2s. So I think it's important important that uh, though you may uh, give very high FiO2s initially, you should uh, come down on the FiO2, uh, you know, and just give, give just enough to meet your target saturation. Thanks, everyone. Um, I can see that we're just a touch over time, but this has been a really interesting discussion. I think from what I'm hearing from the presenters and from the Q&A um, is that, you know, through the course of the pandemic, there's been uh, a lot of confusion, but if there is one through line that's come through after after reviewing all the evidence is that uh, what we know has worked for respiratory failure patients continues to work, and that's frequent reassessment, paying attention and, and not uh, and relying on your clinical skills. Um, and while that's um, it'd be nice for all, for all clinicians to have a rule and a guideline. Um, nothing replaces uh, the vigilance of that clinician. Um, and that, in fact, the suite of things that we can use to care for the patient has broadened uh, in terms of these non-invasive therapies. And until we're able to tease out a definite advantage, um, we know that there are things we can offer our, our, our patients uh, in respiratory failure. Um, and uh, anything or many things are better than, um, than just oxygen alone. Uh, and there's um, lots of good ways to continue to care for that patient as long as the clinician remains vigilant. Um, and so with that, I think uh, I'll just quickly point out that there was a short discussion on uh, pulse oximeters, a uh, question about um, how, in, how you can know uh, about the different types of pulse oximeters. And uh, there is the openoximetry.org project, um, which is working to create this online. I encourage you to check this out. So I think that brings us to the end of our webinar. Um, I want to thank our presenters and panelists and all of our attendees for uh, making this such an interesting discussion. Um, and I hope that brought a little bit of clarity to you and your care of um, the, the respiratory care of the COVID-19 patient. This, uh, these slides uh, and recording will be made available on uh, opencriticalcare.org uh, as will the rest of them. And I wanna thank USAID for convening um, 
uh, these uh, webinars and this webinar series for us. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.